Welcome to the Golden Calm Podcast. Special guest with me today, Ken Goldie. Ken Goldie, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming down. We said Woodland Hills. You drove down from Woodland Hills? Drove down from Los Angeles last night. I had a presentation down here this morning. So I drove down last night, stayed in Carlsbad, did my thing, and you were like on the way back up. So totally. I love it when it works out. Synergistic travel is great. Worked perfect. So I want to get into why you were in San Diego. Yeah, I imagined you were doing some executive coaching or some presentation to executives. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get into all that. Okay. Uh, because that's how I, I connected with you is yep. I, we're in a similar field there. Uh, but for us to get to there, I want to start with an amazing story that you've already told me on the phone with your career. But let's let's start back in uh, grow up high school, college. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles, the what they call the West Valley, west of the 405 freeway, Encino, Tarzana. Woodland Hills in like the 1970s. I mean, it was still like empty lot on every corner and catching frogs and riding your bike to the movie theater at eight years old and all that. The That's valley, the valley. Things. That's the valley. Right. Yeah. And in the 1980s, the whole Nick Cage movie and the Valley Girl song and all of that, Sermon Oaks Galleria, that is where I grew up. Right there. Yep. Awesome. Which is north of LA for those watching outside of California. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, I noticed Berkeley is where you went to school. Yeah. Yeah. So Cal, uh, was that a dream to go to Cal? Or? Um, no, I guess I didn't really know about Cal until I applied to colleges. Um, my going to school was kind of a, I always knew I was going to go to college. I never, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I grew up wanting to be a writer. We'll talk about that. Like I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I hadn't learned about movies yet. I didn't grow up as a particular movie fan. I kind of wanted to be a novelist. But I was also kind of too pragmatic. My mom's a school teacher and my dad's a lawyer and I didn't think I was just gonna be a bartender and like write the next great American novel. So as 12th grade came around and we had to start figuring out where we we're gonna go to college, I applied to all the East Coast schools and Harvard and Yale and Stanford. You just apply everywhere. And back then you couldn't apply to a single UC school. You just applied to the UC system. Um, and I got into Berkeley. And then I, and I got into Stanford and I got in a couple of others and I went and visited them and Berkeley was just right for me. I loved it. A beautiful campus, awesome experience. Different than the Valley. Definitely different than the Valley, right. <clears throat> but great place. Yep. I'm a big fan. Berkeley's got a football stadium on campus. So instead of like driving to Pasadena, like my friends at UCLA, we just walked up to the football stadium on the weekends and it was great. Great fun. Yeah. All right, so you graduate four or five years, however, you do, and did your dream of uh, writing start happening at a school? So I distinctly remember the summer between my junior year and my senior year at Berkeley. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a psychology major. This was the 80s, like LA Law was the big show, so mm -hmm. everybody was applying to law school, and I didn't want to be a lawyer, probably because my dad was a lawyer. I did not know what I wanted to do, and, <clears throat> pardon me, I was at a party down here in Beverly Hills one summer night, and one of the other guys at the party, whose name I can't even remember, this is decades ago, had an internship that summer at a literary agency, I don't remember which one, and handed me a screenplay. It said, read a screenplay. And it happened to be a screenplay to this Tom Hanks, Jackie Gleason movie about a father and a son. I honestly can't remember the title of it, you could look it up, but that was the first screenplay I ever read. And I went, oh, this is cool. Like, I don't have to be a novelist. I can actually work in the movie business and get a job and make a living in the movie business and write screenplays and then actually get paid to write screenplays and make movies without feeling like I'm just being a novelist. So that was it. I went back to my senior year and I got a bunch of books on screenwriting and I started writing the worst screenplays you've ever read on my like stand-up Macintosh computer in 1989. And I don't know about taught myself that quickly, but kind of learned the format of screenwriting. And then when I graduated, I moved back to LA and made my rounds about town and got my first job working for a literary agent, my next job working for a producer and started seeing movies get made and just kind of came up through the ranks. But once I read that screenplay, I'm like, oh, I could have a career in the movie business and be an artist. I hadn't seen that until that moment, so. so it's such a great story. I can just see your mom and dad. Yeah, sorry, son, Ken Goldie's in the movie business. <laughs> I don't, I don't I mean, know that they really, my mom, my parents divorced when I was very young. My mom at the time was married to a, a fairly successful businessman 
who had like the company car and the health insurance, the whole thing. And she was like, don't you want to have a job where you, you know, get a salary and, and, and benefits? And there's nothing of that in the movie business. You didn't even get health care in the movie business, or at least at the time as an assistant. And my dad was a very pragmatic lawyer. I, I definitely got the line, when are you going to get a real job? I think it was 15 years later when I directed my first movie, a movie called The Job with Daryl Hannah, back when DVD was still a thing and the movie got purchased and distributed on DVD when blockbuster videos were still around. And I could actually walk my dad into a blockbuster video and go down the aisle to a shelf and show him my movie on the shelf that he finally thought I had a real job. That's awesome. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. So dudes with their dads and, yeah. how, and how important it is to, I mean, if you want to know a man, I always say, I, I talk about the relationship with the father. I mean, that is always it. So I can, I can picture you doing that with yeah. your dad. It was a, it was, it was a proud day. You That's know, I, I day. thought it was going to be, see my novel on a shelf in a bookstore, right. but by then bookstores were already going out of business. So see my movie on a shelf in a movie store was a, a proud day. It's like, look, Dad, I, I created this. I, I did this, which was pretty pretty cool it's at awesome. the time. All right. Well, so you start in a career as a writer, producer, producer, writer, and you're in the business of making films and writing screenplays, but you're not doing that now. So uh, I know around uh, late 2000s, before 2010-ish, uh, tell me about the atmosphere in Hollywood in 2010. So... For those who aren't familiar with the movie business, there's what we call the studio business, which are the places you've heard about, Fox and Universal and DreamWorks and Sony Pictures and Disney, like the big major studios that control most of what the movie business is. And then there's what we call the independent business, which is indie films, people just going out and raising money and making a movie. And a lot of the greatest movies that we've ever seen have been indie films that studios didn't make. And for the first kind of 15 years of my career, I was in the indie business. So I was writing scripts on my own. I was getting financing for them. That's how I made the job. That's how I made my next film, a movie called Uncross the Stars with Barbara Hershey and Ron Perlman. And, and then right after making Uncross the Stars, I set out to write my next script. Kind of a sidebar story, but there was a movie that came out at the time called Paranormal Activity. You remember that film? Mm -hmm. Paranormal Activity was a, a movie that the whole film was shot through the POV of a handheld video camera of this young couple that moved into this condo. But the whole movie is like, as they're moving in, the young husband has this handheld video camera. He's showing you everything through the handheld video camera. And then there's a ghost in the house. And it wound up being super successful. And a few years before that, there was a movie called Cloverfield, which was a handheld video camera movie about an alien invasion, kids on the run from an alien, all seen through a video camera. And 10 years before that, there was uh, the Blair Witch Project, which was handheld for a witch. And so when Paranormal Activity came out, I thought, there have now been three pretty successful, what they called POV or found footage films, a witch, aliens, and ghosts. Nobody's ever done a, a realistic one. Nobody's ever done a, a real world grounded movie like that. So I came up with this idea driving up north for Thanksgiving one night about a cop on a investigation in a house, one house, one night. And for reasons that are detailed in the story, somebody has to be filming the investigation to make sure it's all done right. So I wrote that script in about a week, I called it Killer, and turned it into my agent. And it's the only time in my entire life that I heard my agent say, I have no notes. And a few weeks later, he sent it out for people to read. I had intended it to be my next film to direct, but then he sold it and he wound up getting like auction bidding on this script. And we wound up selling it to a producer named Walter Parks, who was the head of DreamWorks for many years. And he produced Gladiator and The Ring and several Steven Spielberg movies and all the Men in Black movies. So now I'd sold this script to this pretty substantial Hollywood heavyweight producer, which then opened the door for me to start getting hired by movie studios and paid to write scripts, which shifted my career entirely. I went from being this independent film director who was out on sets making movies and making no money, independent film directors, to somebody now touring the studio system, getting hired to write screenplays, which was amazing. And I got to write some incredible screenplays. I got to adapt Isaac Asimov's The End of Eternity for this producer named Bob Orsi who had written The Transformers, like amazing experience. I got to adapt H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds for a new envisioning of that for Universal Pictures and a book by a guy named Richard Morgan who wrote the book uh, Altered Carbon, which is a series on Netflix. He wrote another book called 13, which I found in the library. 
pulled it down the shelf, loved it, came up with a pitch, sold it, got hired to write it. So now I had this wonderful career as a screenwriter without knowing at the time that screenwriting kind of as a business model was on its decline. And that's a longer story that has to do with Netflix and streamers and the decline of movie theaters. People started really staying at home for their entertainment a lot more with streamers than even when television came out. If you study the history of film in the 1950s, people were worried that film was gonna go away because television was now here. But television was very different from movies. You know, watching Lucy or Dick Van Dyke was a very different experience than sitting in the movie theater and watching Lawrence of Arabia. So they kind of didn't compete. You could stay at home and watch sitcoms on television, or you could go to the movie and have these big cinematic experiences and they were different. But now, Netflix and other streamer stations were bringing very cinematic experiences, even HBO with Game of Thrones, very cinematic experiences on big screen TVs to the living room where a whole family could watch for free or 15 bucks a month instead of $200 to take your family of five to the movies with parking and popcorn and dinner and everything. So people stopped going to movie theaters in large part because streamers were keeping them home. And so over the course of those 10 years that I was getting paid to write, I was actually watching, and the Writers Guild had these statistics. The number of jobs was shrinking, the amount that you got paid per job was shrinking, and the business model of being a writer of two-hour movies intended for screening in the movie theater shrank right when I made it into that world and started to get those jobs. And we all watched that. That's what the strike that just happened was all about. We would have struck, the Writers Guild is my guild, we would have struck in 2020, but it was COVID. So in 2017, we were talking about striking, but didn't. In 2020, we would have struck, but it was COVID. In 2023, we finally did strike because of these issues, that the business model of being a screenwriter wasn't working anymore. So I was watching all of that happen to my life. I was watching this big influx of work as a screenwriter that I thought, this is great, I've made it, I'm a studio film writer now, without seeing that studio film writing was on the decline. Fewer and fewer jobs were happening, fewer, less and less pay for those jobs. And then there was just this big confluence of events. In, in 2019, the, this is a story I'm not gonna tell, but the Writers Guild had a fight with the Association of Talent Agencies. We all had to fire our agents for the first time. So I didn't have an agent for the first time in 18 years. And then right when that ended, I was about to restart with my agent, like early 2020, COVID hit and production shut down and nobody was on set anymore and so no work in 2019 no work in 2020 and then just as things were coming back in 2020 all of these strike issues started to come up which were part of the 2023 strike which then happened so you're talking about like from early 2019 to the end of 2023 like that's a four and a half year stretch of no work because of striking and no agents and, and COVID and striking on top of the general decline of all of that over the last 10 years. And it really became very, very clear to me, I said this to you earlier, that as much as I've loved my career in the movie business, I love making movies, I really love making movies. It's an incredible thing to do. There's so many talented people, wonderful people, skilled cinematographers and actors, and like it's so awesome. But I realized that all that fun and joy that I had that provided me with a living for the last 30 years didn't look like it was gonna continue providing a living till I was 80 years old. And you could say, keep fighting. I could have kept fighting, but just the realistic of every business is you're not gonna do the same work from 50 to 80 that you did from 20 to 50. That's just kind of human beings and the way our world was. And that's doubly so for the movie business. And at that point, I was now divorced with three young children. My, I, uh, at the t she's now eight. At the time, I had a five-year-old daughter and two-year-old twins. So here I am, a suddenly single dad after COVID with a five-year-old and two-year-old twins fighting to make a career work that just wasn't going to work anymore. So I had to, I had to look at, at 50 years old. I had to look at my whole life and go, what am I going to do now? I mean, I never thought that I was going to be anything other than a writer and a filmmaker or do anything else. That had been my soul, purpose, goal, vision, focus, sense of fulfillment and identity since I was 20 years old. And suddenly I had to face, who am I if I'm not that? And what am I gonna do if it's not 
that, on top of which I thought I would be the very worst possible employee somewhere because I had no in-office work experience for anybody else in 30 years. I'd been a, a freelancer since day one. So it was a, it was a moment. It was a what do I do now moment at 50 years old. Uh, and I'll tell you what I can see that you did have, which is a lot of responsibility because you got three mouths mm -hmm. that you got to feed. So you, even if you wanted to, to try to do it again, your responsibilities at 50 is different than your responsibilities at 20. And completely. Right. I mean, what happens if you don't eat at 20? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. No. Right. But, but yeah. So, so this is pretty serious. And I, my anxiety is up just listening to this. Because, I'm making you anxious. Yeah. Well, just yeah, yeah. I just, <laughs> Sorry. well, it's just, uh, it's intense, right? Yeah. You, you are a 50 year old man who has to pivot. And, and so you have pivoted. So there's a good story coming up here. And uh, I met you because you were talking on the Vistage circuit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's where I tracked you down. So maybe a little bit about uh, the Vistage circuit, what that is and how, is that an appropriate time to talk about this? This, sure. next, this next place that yeah. you're going? Okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you where the, the pivot came from is during all that time that I was filmmaking, I was a, a student of leadership. What makes good leadership. I had to lead movie crews and I had to lead movie crews on indie films who weren't getting paid or getting paid a hundred dollars a day. It became very, very clear to me on my early shoots that my job as a film director was to give everybody on that set a reason to show up tomorrow. And it, which means that I had to provide them with a, an experience that was of such value to them that they would return the next day. Say, say it again. My job. My job as a film director. As a film director. Was to provide the crew who was working for free. The grippers, nothing, the gappers. The, 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 the grips, the all, gaffers, the electricians. All, all those guys. The, the costumers, the makeup artists, the PAs, the everybody. I couldn't give them money. They were making nothing. Nothing. Or a hundred bucks a day for they, cinematographers. Like, right. They weren't coming for the money. They weren't coming for the food. They were coming for the experience. Which means if the experience wasn't worth their time, they just wouldn't come back the next day. I had to make sure that their experience on that movie set was valuable enough to them to show up the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day so that we could complete the film. And in that, I started becoming a student of leadership. What is leadership? And reading books and taking classes and practicing it and being part of different organizations that develop leaders from the inside and teaching and training. And I developed this real passion for personal development and leadership development and what all of that means as a human being. I mean, I can say now, this, I couldn't have said this at 22, but I can say now, I grew up with a very narrow view of who I was and what the world meant. I grew up thinking, I'm me, I have to defend me. If I don't defend me, there must be something wrong with me, and I can't let anybody think there's anything wrong with me, so I must defend me. And in defending me showed all the things that were wrong with me that damaged my relationships and undermined my opportunities. It was a long journey to figure out that the only me there is is the me that I choose to be, and that me, you, everybody has the ability to say, I am currently the person that my life experience has brought me to be, but I can choose to be anybody I want. And by anybody I want, I don't just mean choose to be a doctor, choose to be a lawyer, choose to be a baseball player, choose to be a business consultant, or choose to be a podcast host. I mean, choose to be who you want to be. How do you show up to other people? What things do you say? What things do you do? What's your demeanor? How do you interact? How do you want to be with people? And in my 20s, I was not being a very successful person because I didn't learn or know or have experience with any of that. And in my 30s and 40s, I studied that and I practiced that and I practiced it on film sets and I practiced it in my relationships and I practiced it with my life and I practiced it with my children every day. The concept of choosing who you want to be, defining who you are for yourself out of choice and then embodying that, displaying that to other people to create the life that you want to create instead of feeling like the life you're living is the default life created by who your past experience have made you to be that you can't change and what all the external circumstances are that are going on around you. So that, that's, I got into all of that during my filmmaking and applying it when I met with producers and worked on scripts and on set with actors and all of that. So now I'm trying to figure out a new career. You know, you know that story, you know how I 
I listen to that and what I think is, you know, obviously we all have different uh, gifts and talents that we're given at birth for, for no doing of our own. And so some people are tall, some people are smarter, some people are uh, faster, some people have uh, better imaginations. Um, but in sense of being who we want to be, we're all equal. Like everyone has the same opportunity of being the best them. Like yeah. nobody has an advantage. Everyone has the same Everyone is truly equal in being their best self. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That, that is a huge message that I just took from you. Yeah, thank you. Every, yeah. Everyone has the ability to choose to be, not be whatever job you have. I mean, physically, who no, do just, I want to be? Who in do this I want world? to be? I'm equal with everybody. And everybody has different challenges and obstacles. Some people are born with physical handicaps. Some people are born with mental handicaps. Some people are born with, with social economic situations that make things more difficult. But we, we all have advantages and we all have disadvantages. But at a very fundamental level, as you just said, no matter what situation you're in, everybody still gets to say, I'm either going to sink into feeling like I'm locked into being the person that the world would dictate me to be, or I am going to take my circumstances, whatever they are, and still choose to be whoever I want to be in order to create the relationships and opportunities and future that I desire. Now and I'd, you're teaching that on your set. Well, I've been studying right? and teaching yeah, that yeah. for 20 years. And right. now here I was yeah. with my career ending and my marriage ending. And I kid you not, literally within a week. My career and my marriage ended in the same week. And within a week, I went from no longer being able to produce an income as a screenwriter and no longer being in a house with a family to being a single dad living with my mom with no income and no career in seven days. And this is not very long ago. This was two and a half yeah, years. Two and a half, two years, and half ago. years ago. All right. Yeah. All right, let's keep it rolling. Now, keep rolling. what happens next? So, You're a good screenwriter. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really have to write. This is just you. This is just the story. <laughs> this is just my life. The ups and downs <laughs> yeah. of my life. So what happened next? So I got a LinkedIn direct message because you know, I'm on LinkedIn looking for jobs and you're clicking this and that and it's reading the algorithm and I get a message from a woman who teaches public speaking. She's a coach for public speakers and her little ad is earn $150,000 a year as a public speaker. I will show you how and I went, oh, I mean, clearly I can be a public speaker. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I like standing on stage. I like telling stories. I've been doing it my whole life. Pitching a movie is standing up in front of somebody for 25 minutes and telling a story, being on set. Every scene, you're telling a story. I like telling stories. I like to talk, obviously. I, I like to engage people physically. I'm like, okay, public speaker, cool. That's a career. So I hired this woman. I was broke. I hired her. She was expensive. It's the first time I'd ever spent this kind of money on a, on a coach. I mean, it was like $9,000. Like I'd never spent $9,000 on a coach. And I'm living on my mom's couch with my three kids sleeping in one bed. What am I doing? And I take her course for like three months. And it was amazing. She just gives, she doesn't tell you how to speak. She tells you the business. This is the business of public speaking. How you get the job, where you go, what you do when you show up. And I'm learning all this amazing stuff. Do we get her name? Yeah, Orly Amore. Oh, I'll totally give her a shout yeah. out. Anybody who wants yeah. to be a public speaker, look up O-R-L-Y-A-M-O-R, -O -O Orly Amore. Awesome. She's based on the East Coast. She was fantastic. Her course was so worth it. I mean, I'll keep going, but literally like the $9,000 I spent, I earned back. Like, okay, I just wanted to get that in there. Yeah, keep going. Orly yeah. Amore, okay. great plug. She was awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Orly. Thank you, Orly. <laughs> Put that in there. Thank you, Orly Amore. So at that same time, I'm out to lunch with a friend of mine who's a business owner. And he knows what I'm going through. Oh, what are you going to do? And I said, oh, I just did this thing. And I think I'm going to take a stab at being a public speaker. And he said, have you ever spoken for Vistage? And I said, what's a Vistage? Yeah. Like, I had no idea. It's no really chance. not around the movie business. I mean, I knew 500 producers in the movie business. Nobody ever mentioned Vistage to me. Maybe there are some out there who have found it. But it never seemed to be like it cracked the movie business as a core audience. So I asked him. I'll tell your audience here. Vistage is a worldwide organization that puts together, I call them CEO mastermind groups, but they call them peer-to-peer -peer advisory groups where 8, 10, 12, 15 business owners or CEOs or key executives get together in a room once a month and share best practices and ideas for building their businesses and dealing with the challenges of business. And apparently, according to my friend, 
as part of their membership for their all day, once a month meeting, Visage brings in speakers for about two and a half or three hours to talk on a variety of subjects from HR and pricing to supply chain interruptions to whatever the speaker is gonna, gonna do. And he was very gracious. My friend, his name's Mike, Michael Weiser. He runs a company called Xheart, which does garden decor up in Calabasas. He introduced me to his Vistage chair, the guy who runs his group, who was also awesome and spent quite a lot of time working out from the material that I already had, what a three hour presentation to Vistage members could look like and inviting me to come speak to his Vistage group so that I didn't have to just like put in my name on their website that says, do you want to be a Vistage speaker? Click here. I mean, that just seemed like it was going to go into <laughs> not, not a big chance. The dead zone, <laughs> yeah. right? But my friend connected me with his chair who had me come in. I spoke to his group. They score you. I scored well enough to come back a second time and scored well enough to come back a third time. And then I was included in the system. And I started getting a few invitations from Vistage chairs, come speak to my group here, come speak to my group there. This is where a lot of what I learned from Orly came in, now mm -hmm. I'm a speaker. So how am I going to show up? Who am I going to be as a public speaker beyond just the content I deliver? I'll get into this when we talk about the fast way, but a lot of what I talk about, most of my work lives in this foundational difference between your context, which I define as how you think and feel on the inside about yourself or other people or whatever situation you're in. We always have a context. You can't walk anywhere. You can't leave your context at the door. You always have it, whether it's excited or sad or distracted or frustrated or enthusiastic or, or pleasant, whatever it is, you always have a context. And then from your context comes your content, what you say and what you do and how you say it and how you do it. Your context drives your content. How you think and feel determines what you're going to say and do. That's the path that we all go on in life. So now I had all this content. I knew the material that I was going to deliver. But who was I going to be? What was my context going to be in this room? I had to design who I am as a public speaker because it was different than who I was as a filmmaker. And I started going on these sessions, they're like three hour speaking engagements and getting good response. And from that I started getting clients and people started to hire me for one-on-one -on -one coaching and you know doing day trainings, all day trainings for their management teams and then team courses. And it turned into a career that I, I never saw coming and did not know, if you had said to me 25 years ago, you want to travel around the country talking to business owners about you know, leadership? I'd go, no, I want to be a filmmaker. But here I was doing it, and suddenly I was, I was walking into the room with people who owned $20 million companies, $100 million companies, $500 million companies, teaching them things. Like, I would never have thought coming out of filmmaking that what I'd learned would be valuable to somebody who'd already built or owned or was running a $500 million company. But what I quickly discovered is that people are all the same when it comes to this kind of internal self-assessment. We, we all develop bad skills at relationships mm. and we all need insights and tools to work through our own human imperfections in order to create our futures more effectively. And I found that doing that was extraordinarily rewarding. Working with clients to overcome long-held belief systems about themselves and see them thrive in new ways of being that produced extraordinary new results in their lives and, and then having them call me up and saying, I never would have seen that and I never would have gotten there without you. It's just, I never thought I would feel anything more rewarding than standing in a movie theater watching people be entertained by a movie that I'd made until I had somebody call me up and say, I never would have met my wife if it weren't for you. Hmm. That's a great story. And a little plug on Vistage. You know, one, one of the things that I think is a, a staple for Vistage is you do have people that meet once a month, mm -hmm. but it's all people that know they've got more to learn. Yeah. Right? So it's, by, by the default position of them coming once a month to say, okay, peers and speaker, <clears throat> I'm intaking to get a little bit better today. Yeah. And so you've got a great uh, audience there for leadership. And then from a personal experience also, I know that within Vistage, you only need one fan, that first chair. Because that one fan 
knows lots of his contemporaries. They all talk to each other. Yeah. So once you start doing a really good job, uh, as it should happen, as you hope it happens, uh, people say nice things about you and you get picked up. Yeah. And yeah. then there you More go. You're off and running. Yeah. yeah. That's a great story. We'll probably have to send this to Vistage. I'm sure they'll like this. <laughs> I'm sure they'll I like so. this story. I'm, I yeah. have to say I'm a huge fan. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, after speaking for Vistage for about a year and a half and meeting hundreds of Vistage members and dozens of chairs, I became a member. Hmm. Because I was looking at it going, I'm on the other side of this table teaching people who have so much to teach me. Well, you're running a business and it's a good place to be. Yeah. Once a month. yeah. Good. yeah. So, and, and joining as a member has been an entirely different. The fast way would not exist if I hadn't joined Vistage as a member. Okay. So we're coming, we got it. We're going to come to the end, but then we're going to tell people where they can learn more. Okay. <clears throat> but this fast way is something that we should talk on. Okay. So it's very, uh, it's very new. It's, it's coming. Brand new. This was uh, filmed in uh, March uh, 2024. We're, that's when we'll that's release we this. Yeah. yeah. So you've got the fast way coming out. Yeah. It's, it's your program, your system. Yes. It's your stuff. Yeah. Tell me about it. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> so <clears throat> as a screenwriter and film director, the only business model is get a client, deliver, get a client, deliver. There's no such thing as like being a screenwriter who builds a company as a screenwriter with other people writing screenplays for you. They're hiring you to write the script. You go, you pitch, you get hired, you deliver. I came into coaching with that business model because it's all I knew. So I started off speaking for Vistage, going to a presentation, telling people what I do. When people liked my work, they would hire me and I would get a one-on-one -on -one client and deliver and I would get a, a management team of seven to 10 people and I would deliver for a few months or I would go in for a day training and I would deliver. But anybody in the coaching world or even your listeners knowing that you're a physical human being delivering a physical product to people, you're limited by time. You can only have so many clients, which means if you're charging X and you can book so many clients, you know that there is a maximum capability to that. And you can't even really deliver at your maximum. And I have kids coming and going every two days. So my ability to deliver was limited by time and the circumstances of my life. But it was going well. I'd come out of the ashes and built a life and was now making a living as a coach, but also looking at it as what is the future? Where does this go? Not only do I want to grow my business, but how do I reach more people? I don't want to just serve 12 people a year. I want to serve thousands of people. So I joined Vistage as a member. And on the first day, my first meeting, one of the other members was selling his business, right in the middle of selling his business. And I went, oh, I want to sell my business? How do you sell a coaching business? I just blurted it out. They said, well, the only way to sell a coaching business is to have IP, like really good intellectual property that has value to it, and build your business to the point where you're not running it. You know, get other coaches and get them and have something that people actually want to buy. Okay, IP, let's do it. So I spent quite a lot of time looking at the material that I'm already delivering, the coaching that I'm already delivering, the coaching courses that I'm already delivering, and thinking about what is it, what is it really condensed down to? Like if somebody said to me in one sentence, what is what you do? For a long time, I would just talk and talk. It's about this and individuality and, and, and self-actualization and all these kind of words that in large made sense. Leadership but, words. But in, but in, but in a, a, its essence, what does it mean? Boil it down, boil it down, boil it down. This is what I came up with. 100% of who you are for yourself, how you think of and perceive yourself is defined by what you think and what you feel. That's it. That is your entire relationship with you on the inside. You have thoughts and feelings about yourself, about other people, about the world as a whole and other people in the world, individuals or massive groups of people, thoughts and feelings about everything you've ever been exposed to, every situation you ever go into, you walk into with thoughts and feelings. That's who we are on the inside, our identity, our personality, call it whatever you want, it's thoughts and feelings. And all of those thoughts and feelings come out through, your, through what you say and what you do. That's it. You've got nothing else. Think, feel, speak, act. That's your whole you. That is how you interact with yourself and other people and the entire world. And the, other, and the rest of the world engages with you only through what you say and do. You can't reach into another person and know what they're thinking and feeling at the source. You can only have an approximation of what they're thinking and feeling based on what they're doing and saying. So I came up with this little acronym. I'm like, oh, feelings, action, speech, and thought. That comes out to the word fast. That's pretty cool. So. 
people want to accomplish things in their life and they don't want it to take forever, right? You don't want to start a personal development program that it's going to take 30 years to have the results you want. We want results in our life now. So the fast way, okay, so what is feelings, action, speech, and thought, the fast way? I liked that. Like, here's what I do. I teach people how to achieve different results in their life by reeling back that whole engine and starting with becoming intentional, well, bleh, becoming intentional about how you think and feel so that you can express yourself through intentional words and actions that lead towards new results. And the reason I love that is because a lot of coaching, I'm not gonna say all, but most coaching is focused on the doing. Go do something different. Go do something more. Go do more, go do different, and you'll have different results. But we all know through experience that if you just change what you do, like start a new diet or a new exercise program or buy running shoes or, or get your real estate license or your broker's license or whatever it is. If you only change what you're doing, it's not gonna take long for old ways of thinking and old ways of, feel, of feeling to pull you back into old actions. You have to change this. You have to start here. How do you think? You have to change how you think and feel. And a lot of people go, well, what does that even mean? How do you, how do you change how you think about yourself? How do you change how you feel about yourself? What does that look like? So. If you, as a speaker for Vistage, I'm sure you read, we all read a lot. And there's so many great, great thought leaders and writers out there. I mean, there's just so many books. There's Anthony Robbins and Ed Milet and Stephen Covey and, 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 and Jim Collins and, and Burns. And there's just so many of them. You read them. And this is a, a common experience I had in reading all those books. And I love that whole world of personal development and leadership development writing. I love it. So many of the ideas are so profound that I would get to the end of the book, filled with all these ideas, turn the last page and then find myself saying, but how do I do that? This is, a, this is great, but what's the process? What do I do to accomplish this? And they didn't have it. They all left me with, filled with ideas and no path to physically go do it. So I wanted to create a program wherein the, the experiencing of the program you actually go through the transformation. I wrote the book, The Fast Way, filled with exercises. It's got like a 120 page workbook as part of the book. So that you read a chapter and then you do the thing that the chapter talks about. And then you read the next chapter and you do the thing that the chapter talks about. So by the time you've read the book, you've actually done the fast way. You've actually experienced the fast way. And then I wanted the same thing to be possible in a video course. So you can't coach a thousand people on, on a Zoom course, right? You, you just can't deliver the material. I needed to come up with a format where I could deliver the material to a thousand people, but also give all of those people access to the coaching. So about a year ago, I launched my first Fastway course, but it was a scale up, launch, deliver, and end. And I thought that's a hard business model. Scale up, launch, deliver, and end. Scale up, launch, deliver, and end. And just hope that the word spreads to have more and more people in each course that you scale up, launch, deliver, and end. It just seemed like a hard business model. So I finally developed the program in a, in a different format where I've recorded videos of my entire course that I do one-on-one -on -one with somebody. It's the whole course I deliver with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. But it's now in video, which means a participant can, can watch a video and do the exercises and experience the transformation and watch the next video and do the exercises and experience the transformation. So you're not just taking in information, you're actually participating in the fast way as you go. And then once a week, I'm online for an hour for everybody who's enrolled in the course to come online for coaching as a large group coaching like a lab. event, like a lab, yep. where maybe you're asking a question this week and not next week, or you're hearing somebody else's question, you're sitting back and observing until you wanna jump in more. But in that way, I thought, I can grow the fast way. People can participate and more people can participate and more people can participate without having to end it every time. It can just grow and grow and grow. I see it as and people can connect. a movement and connect and speak yep. to each other. It's funny, when I walked in, you said not the slow way. I talk about that in the book. The slow way, the slow way of going through life is believing that everything you think you know about yourself and the world is absolutely fixed on true and that you can't change it that if you have belief systems that aren't working for yourself, 
but you keep doing them because you feel you can't change it. That's the slow way. People go their whole lives without finding success in their relationships, their whole lives without finding fulfillment in their jobs, their whole lives being unhealthy, whether it's weight or cholesterol or diabetes or whatever it is. People go decades holding on to systems that aren't working because they believe it has to be. And I just, that's the slow way. They should do the fast way. To spend your whole life doing something. That's yeah. The fast way is reel it back. <clears throat> Look at what you're thinking and feeling about yourself in the situation. Choose to change that. And then create new actions out of that new belief system that produce new results that reinforce themselves until you're achieving things in life you never thought was possible because you literally never thought they were possible. But now you're telling yourself they are possible. And I'm there to guide you through it with the book and the course and the coaching the fast way. Courses on what platform? Just Kajabi or something like that? I use one called Funnel Cures, Funnel but Cures. it's just like Kajabi. It's a Great. membership site. You sign in, you have cool. access to all the videos. There's a, a landing page up right now. It's www.breakthroughleadershiptraining.com slash live the fast way. And that's where you can go right now. And I send out a free PDF when you register interest. It's called How to Stop, How to, how to what is it titled right now? It's How to Stop Stopping Yourself from going for it, getting it, and keeping it. So you get that little free report as part of an introduction to what the fast way is. Right now, the landing page is uh, sign up for the mailing list and you'll get some access to special pricing when the course launches. The course is gonna launch in May. And I invite everyone to go check it out. And, and literally, I believe this because I've seen it happen over the last three years of coaching. Yep. It changes lives. It changes lives. It takes people mm -hmm. out of feeling like the world is holding them in place and allowing them to understand that they can control their own world. Yep. So somebody might watch this in 2027. So I also say Ken Goldie, LinkedIn, Fastway. Yes. Ken Goldie, I mean, that, that'll probably yeah. be there. You know, LinkedIn, because you never know what you're doing with. Yeah, LinkedIn, so Ken Goldie, So these are all ways to hook up with you. <clears throat> I heard that, um, gosh, I could rewire the way I think. And when I rewire the way I think, you're going to give me practical exercise to practice what I'm thinking. And then as I work through your system, by the time I get to the end, I will say, behold, look at what transformation I've done. You will actually experience the transformation in the course. You will think, feel, speak, act, show up in the world differently and therefore must produce different results. Of sure, the outcomes will be all different. It's Because I'm thinking differently, I'm acting differently. And when I do that, this system, your system, I will produce different outcomes. It's automatic. Yep. I love it, Ken. Ken Goldie, that was terrific. Thank you. Maybe come back again. We'll keep track of you. Oh, I love it. I'll put it. all in the show notes. And uh, if I'm in the Valley, I'll look you up. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, Very fun. Good I appreciate you. your yeah. time. Good job. Thank you. Yeah.